Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our professional development webinar Wednesday for April. Happy Wednesday. And this morning, I'm really excited that we have Erin Main. She's our expert about American income life insurance. I know we always have questions coming up about our achievement days and activities for summer. So she is here and live in person to share with you and have your situations and questions ready because she's excited to answer your questions. And she has also been and walked in your shoes before and worked in the county and been an agent. So she knows where you are and she'll tell you a little bit about herself too. Um, but a little commercial for May on May the 10th. We have our next webinar Wednesday and join Samantha Lawman. She's going to talk to you about all things fairs and achievement days to help you get ready for that May 10th. Um, so watch for that reminder coming out. And then we will take off the summer months, June, July, and August, and come back in September together. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Erin. Um, and she is going to um, have a presentation and we'll have plenty of time for questions. So if you want to open your mic at the end and ask questions, that's perfectly great. And also you can drop in the chat box as well. So Erin. So hi, everybody. Um, as Megan said, I have uh, been a 4-H agent in the past. Um, I was a 4-H camp director in Virginia and a 4-H county agent in North Carolina once upon a time. It's getting further away now, though. It's uh, I was um, in those roles for over 10 years, um, but I have been with AIL now since 2016. Um, Megan, if you want to go ahead and switch, flip to the to the next slide, um, just has some basic information. So a lot of this is probably stuff that y'all have heard before. If you've been around for a while, if you are new, you know. So I apologize for repeating. Um, but and Megan, you can always go ahead and put up the whole slide. So I think this one will end with a, a photo of me with um, one of my embryology chicks, which is now probably ten years old. <laughs> Um, but that that was that's always been one of my favorite favorite photos. So um, yeah, so I, I have been there, done that, collected the hundred gallon tub of t-shirts um, for many, many 4-H programs and events over the years. And I also grew up as a 4-H'er in Virginia. Um, so I've been involved in it in, in some way, shape or form for my entire life, basically. Um, so really uh, am, am glad to be working with AIL now and, um, you know, have the opportunity to work for and with uh, Cooperative Extension and 4-H in this role, but not have to, you know, drive a 15-passenger van or sleep in a twin bed at camp. Um, so those are, that's the bonus with that. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so just a little bit of background uh, about us as a division and then about me. Um, I kind of overviewed, did my stuff already, but uh, 4-H um, has been a part of AIL Special Risk Division since 1952. Um, our motto is serving those who serve others. And that's something that we really take very seriously uh, as a team and, and have for, for many, many years. Um, the annual policies that we do, um, both statewide policies like what y'all have in North Dakota, as well as individual club and county policies have always been a dollar per person for the year. Um, and then the special activities policies have raised, but the, the last time that that, that was increased was, I want to say around 2009. So it's been quite a while since we've had any increases in that. Uh, and a lot of that is due to the fact that um, we have so much confidence that what 4-H and extension is doing particularly, um, <clears throat> aside from any of our other client areas, is, is going to be safe and is going to be using best practices in every situation possible. Um, so we work with uh, NAY 4H, NAE 4H YDP. It's still getting wrapping my mouth around that versus the old acronym, uh, as well as the other extension organizations. So um, ESP, as well as the Ag Agents, FCS, any of those, any of those extension program areas are eligible to use our coverage. So if you have colleagues who uh, in your offices who are not sure about extension insurance, um, you know, please don't hesitate to point them our direction if that's something that we can help with. Um, and we also work with camps, conference centers, uh, student youth travel, all kinds of other organizations, both um, you know, small community organizations and, and more national ones like FFA. Um, you can flip to the next slide, Megan. <clears throat> so, 
So uh, for those of you who don't know, we do have two types of policies. We have annual policies and special activities policies. These are the things that we think are kind of in common for both of them. As I talked about a little bit already, um, low cost is one of the big keys, one of the things that we think is the most important part of our of our coverage is we want it to be affordable. We want it to be reasonable for folks in every um, community situation. I've worked in rural counties and I've worked in bigger cities and um, and know that how much a difference that can make. Um, you know, eight dollars doesn't seem like a lot to most folks, but you know, sometimes when you're working on a really tight budget, it certainly can be. Um, what our policies provide is blanket group accident policy or accident coverage, which is different uh, in scope and benefits from like your liability policy, a property policy, major medical. Um, so blanket accident is the type of coverage if anybody is ever asking you about that. So a lot of times I'll get calls asking for proof of insurance. And sometimes that's like a facility or another organization that you're partnering with. Um, in that case, most of the time what they are looking for is your liability coverage versus ours. Uh, we do have a small staff, so um, full-time there are three employees, myself, one person in claims, and one person in accounting, um, and we have a, a part-time person who helps with admin stuff, um, but we really want you to feel like when you're getting an actual human when you when you reach out to us that's very important we do not have a network of uh, physicians or medical providers or anything so you can always feel free to go to the <clears throat> facility that is nearest to you uh, if there is a situation where you are or having to take a kid for tra for um, treatment so that's something that we you know don't restrict which is different from a lot of major medical policies um, our policies are written in order to be primary. So if you have a, a kiddo that does not have personal major medical insurance through their family or, um, or some other uh, situation, then we are able to act as a primary coverage, but most people do treat our policies as a secondary or supplemental policy in that they submit to their personal major medical coverage first, and then we kind of come in on the back end and either reimburse uh, for out-of-pocket costs, copay, deductible, prescriptions, things like that, or we can pay any remaining outstanding bills at that point. Um, and once we have the <clears throat> once we have all the paperwork that we need, which is usually the most challenging part, um, we try to get claims paid as quickly as possible. So, you know, the worst part with that usually, and any of you who have ever had to deal with even a, you know, a visit to your primary care doctor, sometimes you know that um, billing and, a, you know, medical coding and all of those things, they just, they take a while. And so sometimes we don't get, you don't even get the first bill from the hospital from, for something till three months later. Um, but once we have those things on file, we try to move forward and get things paid as, as quickly as humanly possible. Um, we can go on to the next. Yep, and ultimately, uh, what we're what we're here for is trying to make your jobs easier. Um, so it's something that is a, a benefit that you can provide to your to your families, so that they are not left with unpaid medical bills, essentially. Um, so here's some stuff that just highlights things that are a little different or that are that are good to know about the annual policy. So the annual policy is set up every year. Um, we work with the state 4-H office to uh, to get the numbers um, for all of your enrolled members and leaders throughout the year. So the phrase that we use for what is typically covered under the annual policy is all enrolled youth and volunteers during scheduled adult supervised group activities. So scheduled and adult supervised is a key or key phrases there. Um, this would include pretty much anything that is a 4-H a event, 4-H um, club meetings, field trips, practices, uh, if they are riding in a parade or participating in a show and they are either representing 4-H or they are, <clears throat> that is a part of their 4-H experience. Um, as a scheduled group activity, then that is typically going to be covered under the annual policy. Excuse me. 
individually and individual and family practice is not covered. So that's important to keep in mind that um, kids working individually with their project animals or the three members of the Smith family who are in the shooting sports club practicing archery um, on their own is not going to be covered. Um, it's also important to note that the um, the coverage does not extend to after the club meeting, the kids are out in the parking lot, horsing around, climbing a tree or um, something like that. After the club event is over, um, the then the coverage is over as well. So you have to be really mindful about making sure that folks know, especially if they're hosting meetings at their homes, which we know a lot of folk, a lot of people do, um, uh, you know, kind of that they're aware of, still aware of what's going on and making sure that everyone is, is kind of behaving and things like that. So that if you do have uh, an incident, because you do, if you do have an incident after the club meeting is over, that is potentially not going to be covered. Um, if you're ever sure, unsure about something, you can always shoot me an email. Um, you can check with Megan, of course, or, you know, somebody else in, in uh, the state office as well. But I think, you know, a lot of times it's something that you can reach out to me and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, under the annual policy, new members who enroll after the policy is established are automatically covered until the policy renews. So you just need to make sure that, um, enrolled by whatever definition North Dakota has for that. So whether that is uh, 4-H online or if you have to fill out a paper form and it's, you know, this particular form versus that one, if it's a group enrollment versus a um, an individual enrollment form, whatever that definition is, they do have to be officially enrolled. Um, we don't typically get into too much micromanagement about what that means because it is different from state to state depending on the enrollment um, like database that you use, but we do need to be able to, if there is a claim, we do need to be able to look back at your records potentially and say, and be able to say, yes, Sally Smith was involved, you know, was enrolled as of June 1st and then was injured at camp on June 15th. That's, you know, kind of when the, the instances that we actually have to do that are extremely, extremely rare, but in the event that it happens, we, we want to be able to have that that paperwork on file. Um, and the coverage does include uh, expenses incurred within 52 weeks from the date of the incident. So that would mean things like if you've got a broken bone that requires ongoing physical therapy or, um, you know, visits for casts and different things like that, you can, we can cover bills up to a year after the incident. Uh, again, that doesn't mean wait until 51 weeks to start sending stuff because we because that 52 weeks is the cutoff and we will close claims at that 52 week mark. So, um, and I'll go over this a little bit more in detail with the claims discussion, but, you know, send stuff as soon as possible. But if you have things that are ongoing, if there's situations where there's an ongoing bill, um, keep that in mind that we may be able to pay for up to a year after the incident. We can go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> this is just a um, uh, kind of a list of some things that are not covered and things to keep in mind. Um, and this is, for the most part, these are consistent uh, across all of our policies. Eyeglass replacement, dentures, suicide, those types of things are not covered under um, either of our types of policies. The two exceptions here are going to be the ones that are marked with an asterisk. Um, so uh, an illness is not covered under the annual policy under any circumstances. Um, you can cover illnesses under the 25 and 30 cent rate on special activities, which we'll go over in just a minute. And then uh, downhill winter sports are excluded from the annual policy. So if you have kids that are, if you're at any point, you're going to go skiing, tubing, sledding, any of those kind of things, you would need to take out a special activities policy in order to cover that type of event. Um, Air travel is excluded, and that just means specifically on the the airplane. So if the you know the plane is to crash, we would not have coverage for that. Um, but they would be covered if they're traveling to something like, um, 
you know, a national competition or to Congress or conference or something like that. And they, they fly, they're covered up until they walk onto the plane. And then when they get off on the other side, but they're just not covered in the air uh, on that flight. I think there's one more uh, bullet there. Yeah, children under the age of five are excluded from, from the policy. So this is another time where you want to make really clear to your volunteers and to other people who are leading events um, that that five, that minimum clover bud age is where we, we start. So um, if you have kids that are siblings or, you know, in other situations where folks might be, you know, bringing their other kids with them to uh, programs or events, you want to make sure that the parent or guardian is aware that they are responsible for that younger child and that the coverage does not extend to them. That's a re really, really important. <clears throat> um, one more little bullet down at the bottom there, and then I think it's on to the next slide. Yeah. So again, illness and winter sports can be covered under uh, special activities. So I think the next slide is a um, just a, a chart that shows the benefits for the annual policy, just to kind of give you an idea of what the coverage is there. Um, so $5,000 is pretty much our standard benefit for annual policies for medical and hospital treatment. Um, and then we have coverage for dental as well as accidental death and dismemberment. Um, <clears throat> so we don't we don't have to deal with those very often, but I you know it does happen, and we have the coverage in place there for a reason. Um, knock on wood, we hope that we never have to deal with it, but. It is nice to, to know that that is um, in the policy. That type of benefit is in the annual policy as well as in special activities. And we'll see that slide in just a couple of minutes. Um, so switching over, switching gears a little bit to the special activities coverage on the next slide is just give you some, some more information about that, that type of policy. And Erin, there's one question that came up. Um, if a child was a member last year but starts attending club meetings in the next year and has not officially enrolled, does that mean the child is not covered? So technically no. Um, they they need to get officially enrolled by, you know, in order to be in the in the current year. So like if there if there's a gap in that enrollment, there there potentially could be a time where they're not covered. Um, you know, I would say just in general, it's kind of best practice to go ahead and and get them to to re-enroll um, as soon as possible. I'm not sure, like, let's see. Starts attending club meetings that you're not officially enrolled for the new year. Yeah, I mean, the way that the coverage works, so like if the policy starts on, I think it's September 1st, you know, we, we you enroll, call it 10,000 kids as of, you know, no, or as of September 1st. And then as of October 1st, maybe there's 10,020, December 1st, there's 10,050. We don't, we don't require you to go back and, and redo that. We understand that there's going to be fluctuations like up, down and sideways within enrollment. Um, so the main thing would be that if there is, is an, if there is a claim, you would need to be able to verify when that child was officially uh, enrolled. Um, so that's the, the biggest thing with that. And I think the next question kind of goes along with that. They have a, a paper copy in the office indicating they're enrolled, but not in 4-H online. That would be a question for you. Okay. Yeah, because um, it's kind of like, Again, we don't get into too much micromanagement of what enrolled means uh, because it can be different. So you, but if you have that backup paperwork, I mean, I would say that for our purposes, it would suffice if you had something dated, but if what is official for North Dakota requires that online piece, then, you know, the best practice is to try and get that done as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> so with that statewide annual policy, um, 
you're going to be covered for a large, large majority of your events where it is quote unquote, just 4-Hers and volunteers participating. Um, there are still a few situations where we do recommend uh, taking out special activities. And there is, it's hard to give an exhaustive list um, in any circumstance because there's always things that come up that it's, it's hard to make a definition. Um, but a few examples are times when you have multiple day events or travel events where you want illness benefits to be included. Um, as I mentioned, the illness is excluded from that annual policy. And <clears throat> the reason that we suggest it specifically for multiple day and overnight events is because there is a um, restriction on the illness coverage that there are a couple of restrictions on the illness coverage, but it has to be, it cannot be a pre-existing condition and it has to manifest itself during the covered event. So something like a one day event where um, they you know, participate from eight to five during the day and then they go home that evening and get sick, we don't know specifically, they're not, they're not sick during the event, so that would not be covered. But if they come to a three day camp and on day two, they're in a, they end up with food poisoning or something like that, then that is covered. Um, COVID is an example where we've had a lot of like complications trying to figure out exactly, you know, how, how to cover that or if we can cover it because the, because of the incubation and asymptomatic periods, um, we have had very, very few COVID claims get approved because, uh, there are so many factors that go into, you know, when, someone is sick versus when they start showing symptoms versus, versus when they test positive and all of that. So most of our co approved COVID claims have been for things like camp staff who are on site for several weeks at a time and don't have any other um, exposure other than being on the camp property. Um, so again, illness can be covered under the 25 and 30 cent premium options. So if you are doing a, a multiple day overnight travel type event where you think you want that illness coverage, that would be a time when you can take out special activities. Um, downhill winter sports, if you want any coverage for that, you do need to do that under special activities. Any of the rates are acceptable for that, but, um, you know, when we do it, downhill winter sports or, some, or something like for me, ATVs and horses, um, everything is fine until it's not. But when you do have an injury, it tends to be something that is, um, that's bigger. So having that 30 cent, that highest coverage is, tends to be the best choice if, if that's available, if that fits into your budget. Um, sorry, one of my cats is getting right to me. Um, <clears throat> let me see. I lost the screen there. Yes, tubing is included in downhill winter sports. Skiing, tubing, sledding, snowboarding, any of that stuff. Uh, Cross-country skiing is fine under the annual. <clears throat> Sorry, my internet went out for a second. Oh, that's okay. Um, and I can, I can always pop mine up there if I need to. Um, it's just easier, like you said, with, uh, managing one is this uh, is this where we are screen uh yeah we can i think we were on the last screen um the last the slide right before that oh maybe maybe a couple back let's see hmm. Okay, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so uh, other examples of it, when you might wanna take out special activities coverage um, and we'll go over a little bit more. We saw that flow chart popped up. Some of you I'm sure have seen that before, um, but programs or events that are open to non 4-H youth. So if you're doing day camps, workshops, um, field days, any of those kind of programs where you have uh, either all non 4-H youth or a mix of participation, um, special activities coverage can be really is recommended. And then if you have any high risk programs that are volunteers who have not been covered by any annual policy. Um, so if you're doing a one day event and you have someone who is a, an episodic volunteer, let's say that's volunteering specifically to do this woodworking, you know, or, you know, um, 
chainsaw juggling activity um, with your four majors, uh, that then they're not an annual volunteer, they're not covered under that, then you would be in good shape if you would take out special activities for that. Um, let's see, I saw in the chat, uh, how much lead time do you need to take out special activities coverage? Um, we recommend doing it at least 24 hours in advance so that you can make sure that you get it in and get the uh, initial confirmation email. Um, the activity reports are time stamped when they come in. So you submit an online activity report that's linked there. Um, and when we get that, we have to manually review and process each one. So you may not get the official confirmation of coverage within the same business day, um, but you know, I would say submit it at least a day or two in advance to make sure that if you have any problems with the submission, because that does happen sometimes, you know, the website's down or, you know, a typo is preventing it from submitting or something like that. We do have those little things that need to be, uh, do some troubleshooting sometimes. Um, so if you can get it in a little bit sooner, that helps with everybody's peace of mind. I'm actually, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna go on and hold the questions in the chat if that's okay, um, just so that I can make sure I'm getting through all the information. Um, if we can go on to, go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is the flow chart that I mentioned. And like I said, some of y'all have probably seen this before. This is not an exhaustive um, thing. This is kind of an example. And I try to keep it as, um, generic as possible because we send this out to all 50 states so everybody has different you know different policies different things that they do but this is a kind of a general guideline for you to think about whether you want uh, special activities coverage and how it would be set up so um, this is included in the powerpoint and i think megan actually has a, a pdf version of it that she can also send out as well um, so just kind of think about this if you are have an event that you're coming, that you're planning, and this can give you some guidance. And if you're not sure, you can always reach out for questions. Uh, to the next slide, please. So the, uh, the special activities policy start at 20 cents per day. They're 20, 25, or 30 cents per person per day. The next slide has a full breakdown of what the, the benefits are, but essentially as the rate increases, the benefits increase as well. Um, there is an $8, $8 minimum premium for all special event policies. Uh, that applies to the whole event for programs uh, that are one day or multiple consecutive days. So something like an overnight trip, or if you have a day camp that meets every day for a week, something like that. But it is uh, each day for multiple non-consecutive days, like meeting every Monday for a month or every third Thursday or something like that. Um, so th keep that in mind when you are planning and budgeting for how you're going to set up your special activities coverage. Um, special, I'll, as I kind of mentioned earlier, our, all of our coverage is blanket coverage, which means that we don't require a list of names or, or folks, but you have to be able to verify that everybody in a particular event or in a particular group is being covered under the same policy. So when you take out a special activities policy for anyone in an event, you must count and cover everyone in the event. So an example that I usually give for something like that, um, is uh, like a livestock show. Um, and that this also includes the next, the, the bullet under that, that this does it, that special activities does not cover spectators or members of the general public. So you've got a livestock show, um, you know, you're gonna have your kids that are exhibiting in the ring, you're gonna have judges, ring masters, you may have people that are handing out ribbons, announcers, um, people who are running gates, parents uh, who are helping with trailers and um, fitting in the barn, any of that kind of stuff, all of those people are participants and volunteers in the event, or then the other phrase that we use for that is involved in the operation of the event. So they are able to be covered under special activities. You would not be able to cover um, grandma and brother and sister that are coming to sit in the audience. So registered participants, as well as the volunteers involved in the operation of the event. And remember that if you take it out for anybody, you have to take it out for everyone. 
Um, special activities policies do cover accidents and some illness under the 25 cent um, and 30 cent options. We, you submit your activity report online in advance of the event with an estimated number of participants, and then you pay for the actual number after the event is complete. Um, if an event is canceled or the date is changed, you, uh, there, if it's canceled, there's no premium due. If the date is changed, we just need notification in writing in order to update the date. Um, and cancellation is just notification in writing as well. So all you have to do is just shoot us an email if you have a situation where an event is canceled or the date is changed. And we just need the, um, the serial number and the event. And the serial number is what each special activities policy is defined by. And that is included in your confirmation email. When you get your confirmation emails, it'll always have the policy number, which is 718 A, B, or C for the three different options. And then uh, there'll be an, a unique serial number specifically for that activity report for that event. Um, this, this policy, special activities, can be used for collaborative programs, um, events that you're doing with other community organizations, things like, again, a joint FFA and 4-H livestock show, if you're doing a field day, working with soil and water conservation, any of those kind of things, um, but it should ideally be used for um, programs. There's one more, I think there's one more uh, PIP there. Um, where 4-H and Extension does have some of the planning and some of the, you know, major responsibility for the event versus like you're just showing up on the day and um, leading a, a booth at a rotation style field day sort of thing. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. This is just uh, the chart of the full chart of the benefits for special activities. Again, um, as the benefits increase, or as the rate increases, the benefits increase as well. And you see, I'm not going to read through everything, but you see um, there are, you know, pretty robust limits, particularly under that 30 cent option. Um, the, the goal of this policy is to, you know, reduce or eliminate out-of-pocket costs. Um, it, it may not if there is some kind of major incident, but we try to hopefully take care of as many things as possible. Um, and if the 30 cents uh, option is in your budget, I do tend to recommend that just because um, you're gonna get to the high, highest benefits on it. Um, we can flip to the next. Yeah, just a few general like tips and hints kind of things. This is all for the most part um, common sense, uh, but it is really important to kind of be aware of Murphy's Law type stuff. Um, we, we have situations pop up all the time. I, you know, I think I've, just when I think I've seen it all, um, we get a, a, a new or different kind of claim. Um, and we understand that, you know, kids are kids. And there's going to be things that are going to come up that you cannot control, even in the best planned and executed program. Um, make sure that in addition to, uh, and we're going to go over specific claim stuff for us on another slide, but make sure that you and your volunteers are aware of what your internal reporting uh, procedures are, because that is an important step to make sure that you're following, you know, your state 4-H rules. And it also helps with um, having uh, timely documentation that can be sent to us. So if you're, you know, submitting an, an incident report to the state within, you know, a required five days or whatever it is, um, if you have that, then while stuff is fresh in your mind, then you can, you know, make sure that you are also have that available for us. Um, the statewide annual policy is this A and D number. Um, and then again, if you have something that's covered under a special activities policy, that may be um, the 718 and then a serial number. Uh, the serial number will be in your confirmation email. So always keep that in mind if you have an event um, that needs, that you need to file a claim under. Okay, we can go to the next slide. The, the statewide policy, and I don't know if I was clear about this, the statewide policy doesn't require uh, a serial number. It just is the annual policy number. Um, so I'm not gonna read through this verbatim, but 
the the biggest things to note um, are that the the sooner you can file a claim after you have an incident that requires outside medical treatment, the better. Um, you know, I'm not expecting you to be, uh, you know, downloading a PDF and trying to fill it out on your iPad from, you know, five minutes after the um, ambulance has pulled off. Um, but the sooner you get that done, the better. It is better for us to have that form and not need it than the other way around. You know, so if something if something happens and there's any kind of out, outside medical treatment, um, I would always default to filling out and submitting a claim form to our office uh, as soon as possible. Um, we do ask that those be sent within 20 days of the incident, but no later than 90 days. We, and we do unfortunately deny claims that we don't get uh, until after that time frame. Um, a lot of the reason for that is that there are situations where um, there are uh, like secondary injuries. Um, and after a certain period of time, we're unable to you know, track efficiently where and when the injury first occurred. Uh, one specifically that I remember is we had a kid that, you know, um, sprained an ankle at a, at a camp. And then the next week he went to football practice and made it worse. And then, you know, after that, these were the first time he went to the doctor um, and submitted, started submitting claims. And we were unable to pay on that one because there's no way to verify um, that that wasn't a pre-existing condition, that, that the injury happened during our specific, you know, or whether how it would have gone if he hadn't gone on and injured it further. Um, so that's something to be really aware of. Uh, all the claims information there, the, the email is the best way to, to get in touch uh, and to send things as well. Um, but you can also send stuff by, by a hard copy mail or fax, I try to steer people away from fax these days. But um, it is an option if that's the best way for you to do it. And uh, after the initial claim report has been filed, make sure that you are communicating with us as well as the parent or guardian uh, as consistently and, and openly as possible so that we can make sure that we get things taken care of as soon as we can. Um, the PDF of the claim form is available on the website um, and that really is the best one to use. <clears throat> I think we lost Megan again, so I'm going to pull up my uh, file here. <laughs> Looks like I can sh maybe share my screen. Let's see. Oh, well, that was the last slide, apparently. Um, <laughs> so, great, that works. Um, so, hold on one second, share screen, here we go, share. So the claim file, that claim screen was the last screen. Um, other than this, uh, questions is where, you know, it's, it's really important for you to be able to, to get in touch with me. Um, like I said, in the beginning, I kind of, you know, have, have a pretty good idea of what y'all are doing on a, on a general basis. Um, the programs and activities really do vary quite a bit from state to state. So I know that it's not exactly the same for everybody in North Dakota that it would have been for me in North Carolina. Um, but I um, am always happy for you to reach out and would, you know, would rather answer a hundred questions before something happens than, you know, than a hundred questions after. Um, so that is something that I um, really am, am always happy to do. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the share, but I did, and I know there were some questions that came in through the chat that I didn't get to. So um, I'm going to go and Megan's back. Yay. I'm um, back. I'm on my phone, so <laughs> Can you okay. see the chat? Did you get through um, all your slides? I can it. see the chat and I, there was only one more slide. So, okay. um, yeah, so that is, there we go. So just scrolling back up, I think I got to Dawn's question. It looks like Renee said, if you have volunteers that help at the fair, but aren't signed up as, um, 
a 4-H volunteer, do we need special activities coverage? The technical answer for our purposes is yes. If you want coverage for those people that volunteer at, at that event, at the fair, um, but they are not signed up as 4-H volunteers, you would need special activities coverage. Um, if you want them to be covered under us. Um, I do not know the specifics about what your requirements are for if you, you know, if you have like a, an episodic volunteer application versus a full volunteer application where folks are background checked and that kind of thing, that may be something that the state office could speak to a little bit better in terms of um, the specifics on that. But the technical answer for us is that anybody who needs coverage under, uh, that is not an official volunteer would need special activities coverage. Um, and then there's a couple questions about achievement days. Is achievement days a special activity or covered similar to a club meeting? Your enrolled 4-Hers and volunteers would be covered for achievement days for the, uh, and the way I understand achievement days, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, is that it it is similar to like a county fair or your shows. Is that Am I getting that correct? Okay, so <clears throat> so your 4-Hers and volunteers would be covered for achievement days for the things that they're doing that are a part of their 4-H experience. So if that includes livestock shows, if that includes demonstrations or working at the food booth or um, any of those kind of things that are a part of achievement days that are part of their 4-H experience, they are covered. But if you have other people who are like the livestock show is open to other for other folks other than 4-Hers, um, you know, you may need specific uh, special activities coverage for those events during the achievement days. I think that, I don't know if that's the kind of the same thing that you were asking as well, um, Ashley, about achievement days considering special activities. Um, okay. Uh, it looks like Julianne has your, has her hand up. Yes. Thanks. Um, okay. So regarding that, if we're having a show and then, um, parents or whatever, just come in and help us on the fly and they're not enrolled, do we take information from them at that point to try and get them to put them on our insurance or fill in some special activities coverage information for them at that time or how does that work so the the special activities policy does need to be submitted online in advance but you only have to have the estimated number of participants um, so if you have an event where i guess i would say typically you would have parents um, that are that are going to come and help on the day of, but you don't necessarily know the exact number in advance. That's understandable and that's fine. You still would submit a special activities coverage in advance with the estimated number. And then on the day of, you know, do your best to track um, and, and, you know, know how many you had and then you submit the final number and pay for the actual number after the event is complete. We know that this is not a 100% exact science, um, you know, and especially on days like that, big, you know, events where um, things are, uh, you know, kind of in flux at various times, it's hard to like sit down and like, you know, have a sign in sheet. Um, but, you know, we rely on y'all as, as the extension professional to kind of do the best you can. Um, with that and, you know, hope that you would have some kind of, you know, some kind of documentation, like whether it be a sign in sheet or just a, like a list that you made or something like that, where you can say like, yes, you know, John Smith was here helping his son, you know, with the event and was covered and then was injured. And honestly, I would say, you know, not more, but we get you know, quite a few claims on, you know, parents and adult volunteers specifically for livestock and horse shows, because they are the ones that are dealing with moving, moving panels for show rings. They're the ones that are unloading trailers um, and are kind of, you know, standing in, in the way when the steer comes piling out, um, you know, so those, those things do happen. So, um, 
you know, and this is not about like, you know, trying to make a sale or anything. This is just, you know, just from our experience, these are the things that we see. Um, so if they are not, you know, if everybody that's not pretend participating in and in, involved in the operation of the event um, is not officially enrolled, then it's best practice to to get them covered in some kind of way. Okay, thanks. And then did you say um, whether or not that includes our judges? So if your judges are volunteers, you can count and include them. If your judges are, if it's a professional thing and they have workers' compensation, then they may not be able to be covered. But if they're if they're a volunteer or if they're doing it like as an independent contractor that doesn't have um, workers' comp set up, then they may be able to, to cover. Okay, because I know um, I can't speak for anyone else on this call, but sometimes... Um, to get a volunteer, we offer to pay their mileage. Mm -hmm. So then at that point, we'd put them on special activities. Yeah, if you're taking out special activities, I would include them in, in those okay. numbers. Right. And I don't think Super. that pay, reimbursing for mileage uh, is not, you know, does not make them an employee where they're, right. you know, covered by workers comp. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Danielle has a hand raised and then I'll go to the chat. Yes, thank you, Erin. I have two questions that came up this, this month. I think I've asked this one before, but when we are taking kids on a bus, enrolled or not enrolled, regardless of who owns the bus, they are covered, correct, if we've taken out the special activities insurance? Correct. Direct travel to and from events is covered under both types of policies. So if it's a, if it's, um, whether it's annual or special activities, direct travel on a bus, van, you know, personal vehicle um, can be covered. Okay, because I know that's come up with the bus where they say we can't cover your riders, but that is something that we can cover either with the enrolled or the special activities. Got it. Cor correct. And then my other question real quick was, um, this is our service month and a group had asked about ditch cleaning. And I thought that there was some agreement with the highway department that they would be covered for liability there. But as I understand, if they're not on a signed contract, they can't. So if they're enrolled 4 H is cleaning a ditch, they would be covered. Correct. If that's an, a, okay. a, an official 4 H activity, yeah, community service or, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we had a question from Angie about, I'm just going to read it to myself. Okay. Um, we don't require, uh, so ATV and, uh, and stuff doesn't require like extra insurance for our purposes. If the kids are, um, if the kids are either enrolled or if you do the special activities, you can do that at any rate. Um, ATV and horse, as well as team sports, are covered under the $2 rate for annual policies. And so if you did, if that was like an ATV specific club, that that was the only activity or the primary activity that they did throughout the year, they would be paid at the $2 rate. But for special activities, we don't like, we don't regulate which rate you would need to cover that under. Um, and as long as that is an approved activity through North Dakota 4-H, then they would be, they would be able to be covered under special activities for that. Does that get to what you were asking, Angie? Okay. Um, Summer asked if you have special event coverage, it wouldn't cover community members for an open community supper. Co co essentially correct. So when you have events that are open to the public, the, the key kind of definition for us is whether it is a controlled or not controlled environment. So for um, let's say a fundraiser dinner where everyone comes in and sits down and eats together at the same time, everybody's in the school cafeteria, everybody arrives between 6.30 and 7 and everybody leaves between 9 and 9.30. 30, that is a controlled environment. Everybody's all in the same place at the same time versus something where it's, you know, come in between five to eight and pick up your plate. You know, some people will eat there. Some people will take it home with them, you know, those kind of things. So you are able to cover, you know, people that come in and register or that are come in for a controlled environment, but not something that would be like a come and go, uh, open community supper, um, you know, uh, 
what's another thing like um other community events like not fairs but festivals those types of things where people are coming in and out um garden tours where people kind of maybe can come for 10 minutes or can come for two hours those are the kind of things that are are typically not what we would consider a controlled environment um, and yes, Rebecca, thank you for the, for typing the the uh, answer to Tessa there, but that's correct. It's 20, 20, 20, 25 or 30 cents per person per day with an $8 minimum. Um, so if you have an event where you have, you know, 20 kids for one day at the 30 cent rate, you would, when you do that multiplication, it only adds up to $6. So you just round up and pay the eight in that circumstance. That's another reason that if you have small events, a lot of times it behooves you to go ahead and charge, or excuse me, and choose the higher rate because you're gonna get the highest benefits on that. And if you choose, again, in an example of 20 kids for one day, your premium only adds up to $4 and you're gonna have to pay the $8 anyway. So you might as well get the, the higher benefits with that. I do see one more question from Jeff Stockler. I can read it. Um, if a parent is present at a 4-H club meeting but are not enrolled in 4-H, is a 4-H volunteer, are they covered if helping at the meeting and become injured? No. Yeah. So that is, again, that's a situation where you want to be very sure that parents are kind of aware that if they're not enrolled as volunteers um, and if they, you know, they want to help, they're they're not going to be covered under this specific policy. Um, and then, okay, I see a hand up from Annette. Okay, just wanted to make sure I had this right. So we have achievement days. There's 40 judges. They're not enrolled, but we have 200 kids. So then do we have to say that would be 240 people since we have to get everybody that's at the event? Correct. Okay. And the, the reason for that is because it is that blanket coverage, um, we have to cover everybody in order to cover anybody. So this is a very extreme example, but if we had a situation where a tornado hit the building and there's, you know, 150 plus people injured, it would be very difficult, if not impossible for us to sit down and say, okay, these people are covered under the annual policy with these benefits. These people are covered under special activity with these benefits and making sure that it's, that it's equitable. Um, on that. Okay. Any other questions? I was going to remind people too that um, this information is still on the Google Drive. Um, the the annual policy certificate. So I know some people have needed that for some, some things that they've had, and so we do have like a one pager that we get from Aaron every year that says that we purchase our insurance for the state. And so that's on the Google Drive. And when I send out um, Aaron's flowchart and the um, PowerPoint, I can also remind you where that is on the Google Drive to look for. So, and also we have a um, the link there to sign up for your special insurance coverage as well. Um, looks like Jeff has a hand up. Yeah, uh, Aaron, so um, I don't understand the full cover insurance coverage of our that our fair board has. When, when does fair board or fair coverage end and this begin or vice versa? Uh, because the 4-H is the 4-H the program is still part of the fair. We still need to have this for our livestock or ecstatic judging, uh, even though it it's on the fairgrounds. Uh, how does that all work? Can you straighten me out on that, please? I can try. So typically, um, what your fair board is going to have, and they may have, you know, they may have five different insurance policies, depending on, you know, how organized they are and, you know, how big your county fair is or all of that stuff. So typically what their policies are going to be is going to be like property casualty and liability policies, but they will not have this specific type of accident coverage. So 
um, our policies are regardless of liability. So if there is a if there is a, a situation where um, let's say there's like damaged equipment and it's something that the the fair board, you know, quote unquote, should have been responsible for, and there is something that could be a liability claim against their their insurance policy, um, we would still be able to pay for the accident, for the injury. And then the idea, the idea with this policy is, a, is essentially that it's a first line of defense, right? So if you're filing a liability claim against the fair board's um, insurance policy, that's typically something where the university is getting fully involved. There's lawyers, there's like a whole big process that happens if there's liability claims being filed, whereas ours is kind of the first line of defense, we hopefully will take care of the bills and it's not going to rise to the level of needing to needing or wanting to file that additional claim. Um, so it's typically a different type of coverage. They may have coverage on their, you know, on their building and facilities. They may have some kind of catastrophic coverage for, for different things, but it's just a different type of coverage from what we do. All right, thank you. Thank you. Now, Megan, a uh, uh, comment that was made last week, and this brings this up here. I think Aaron had mentioned it at some point in time. If we automatically fill, file a claim with Aaron, does that mean we have to file with the university an accident report um, during any of these activities where people are covered? You should fill out one of the accident reports, those docu-signs, the, like, an incident report with the university. All right, thank you. I see uh, Annette still has a hand up. I don't know if that's a new question or from before. Nope, sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody else? And Jeff, I was going to, I'll just, yeah, I can um, put the link to that as well in the email as well, just to, the link to how to fill out the university incident report, because they like to have that, because there's an employee one, so it'd be different if something like were happened to you or something, where there'd be a non-employee too, so there's two different ones. I can remind y'all about that as well, so we're um, we're winding down our time till um, noon so we want to be respectful of people that need to jump off so um, if there's any more last minute questions um, we can take a couple more now all right well if not I'll just um, thank everybody for joining us and I really really appreciate Aaron doing this for us yearly because we have so many new faces and people come and go and we're cranking up for our summer season so I really appreciate you Aaron doing this for us and again, I'll um, get some information and send that out in an email to everybody. And then Erin is wonderful. She always responds right away. And so I can include her email's address as well if you want to ask her a question, because I may not all. <laughs> I think Megan's internet kicked her out again. Um, but yeah, as, as she was saying, definitely don't hesitate to, to reach out, call, email, carrier pigeon. Um, email tends to be the fastest just because I do, I am still, I, I am primarily working from home, um, but I have my, my email with me, you know, pretty much all the time. So um, unless I am, you know, physically on a beach somewhere, I pretty much am, am answering emails. So, <laughs> uh, so don't hesitate to reach out and I'll always right. try to get back to you or point you to somebody who can uh, as soon as possible. And so thanks for joining us today. And don't forget, May the 10th, we're having our last one for this um, semester. And it's going to be Samantha Lawman talking about achievement days and fairs helping you to get ready. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next month. Bye, Megan. Take care. <laughs>